Hi everyone, I'm Nancy Ayres, the Chief Operating Officer of the National Film and Sound Archive of Australia. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land from which I'm speaking to you all, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and to extend the acknowledgement to all traditional custodians across the lands we occupy. This is our final session for day one of Digital Directions 2020, and I'm sure you'll all agree it's quite the topic, media literacy in the machine learning era. As we all cast about the internet, read about deep fakes, or fall down conspiracy Twitter threads, there's really no doubt about it. Media literacy crystallises as a fundamental skill for our digital present and our future. I'm so excited for you all to meet this panel. I'll let them introduce themselves in a moment. Please add your questions to the chat window below and moderators will pass them along to the panel. I'd like to thank you all for joining us for the first day of Digital Directions 2020 and for taking part in our first virtual conference. Enjoy the panel. Welcome everyone. Welcome to Digital Directions, the annual update on digital culture. My name is Jan Muller and I am the CEO of the National Film and Sound Archive and indeed today we will talk about media literacy in the machine learning era. With me here today are Ellie Rennie, Annabel Asbury and Jason Potts. Welcome guys, good to have you here. Unfortunately, oh, Dr. Yeah. Asher Flynn, Associate Professor of Criminology at Monash University can't join us today. Um, Ellie Rennie is a professor at the RMIT in Melbourne. Her current research is focused on social and policy questions arising from automation technologies, including blockchain. She has works, worked extensively on the topic of digital inclusion, particularly in the relation to the remote Australian and indigenous communities. Annabel, Annabel Asbury is the head of digital education at the ABC. As a strong advocate for media literacy and recognizing the need for current engaging resources for students and teachers, Annabelle conceived Media Literacy Week, knowing that the expertise and trust of the national broadcaster is well placed to broaden Australia's knowledge and understanding of this topic in a news and media environment that changes at a rapid pace. And Jason Potts is Professor Economics and Director of the Blockchain Innovation Hub at RMIT University. His research work focuses on the economics of innovation and new technologies and economic evolution. He publishes on topics including creative industries, economics of cities, and recently on crypto economics and blockchain. Before we start our conversation, I would like to start with a video about one of the today's hot topics, uh, deepfakes. One man with total control of billions of people's stolen data, all their secrets, their lives, their futures. In case you couldn't tell, this is not Mark Zuckerberg. The video is what's known as a deepfake a term used to describe synthesized media created by artificial intelligence. To address their concerns, their hopes, and their dreams. This deepfake was shared on Instagram by user Bill Posters as part of an exhibition called Spectre, which uses manipulated videos of high-profile figures like President Trump and Kim Kardashian. So many haters, I really don't care. Just last month, Facebook was widely criticized for its decision not to take down a video of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, which was altered to make her appear drunk. Instead, Facebook said it would heavily reduce the video circulation on news feeds and add an informational box with links to fact-checking sites. Facebook, which owns Instagram, said it will follow the same policy with the altered video of Zuckerberg. CBS has asked Facebook to remove the deepfake because CBS news graphics appear on the video. This is the latest example of how tech companies are struggling to deal with the proliferation of manipulated video content, which some experts worry could have a negative impact on the looming presidential election. Annabelle, can I start with you, please? Um, how important is media literacy for young Australians who are engaging with media online younger than ever before? It's Thank you for the invite, Jan, and thank you for the introduction. Um, just before I start, I would like to acknowledge that I'm presenting from Wurundjeri land and Wurundjeri country um, down in Melbourne in Victoria, and I pay my respects to any elders, past, present and emerging, who may be in the audience today. 
media literacy is, well, first of all, I always um, start when I start talking to educators and to students that I talk to um, them about media literacy being literacy. <laughs> um, you really can't be literate without being able to engage and critically evaluate um, and analyse um, not only news media, but all of the media that you're exposed to on a daily basis. And whether that be advertising, whether that be film, whether that be through journalism, um, whether that be through television or through any other sort of screen media, um, even through books or comics or those sorts of things, especially games. So it's such a such a crucial sort of set of amount of or amount of skills that you have to have to be able to engage in society. And one thing that I always say about media literacy is that it's critical to civic engagement that you can't be a fully rounded citizen, I believe, if you're not media literate, because if you don't have those skills, if you're not equipped with the skills to critically analyze and criticize media around you, it's very difficult for you to be able to equally participate within society. On that note, so that participating part, we've seen the video and, and, and a lot of deep fakes on the internet are, are, are pretty easy to, to spot, to you recognize that you saw these examples here. But what happens when uh, deepfake technology is used on everyday people, for example? And, and how do we build a sense of, let's say, critical thinking into young people when they, when they access digital media online? Yeah. Well, I don't think it's just the responsibility of young people themselves to know how the technology is actually changing around them. I think it's also the responsibility of their parents and also the responsibility of educators to know what's going on in the world in technology wise, um, even what sort of um, new technologies are emerging or, you know, tricks that are emerging through AI um, to manipulate the media. So I do think that it's just not um, a, a sort of, you know, students, you must find out about this. I do think it is um, for the collective society. Um, only just the other day in the New York Times, there was um, a very good article about um, the sort of generative advers adversarial um, the network, which looked at basically how um, AI was actually using very common pictures and basically creating new personas or new photographs of people um, that were completely um, artificially generated. And that becomes quite sort of complex and um, difficult for, for students who are in a world that is, oh, not, only, not only for students, but for um, for people within society who are exposed to so much media and information and being able to distinguish between what's real and what's not, or not so much um, just a binary about what's real and what's not, but trying to understand why things might be manipulated or how they've been manipulated. There's also some support from, from the media industry. There's this company called Sensity that that, uh, that detects and reports deep fakes online. That's as an algorithm that detects these, these deep fakes. Ellie, um, how can technology help improve media literacy? I think that this is a difficult one in that what we're doing when we say that we need greater media literacy here is we need greater mistrust, essentially. Um, and I'm, I'm also concerned that the levels of mistrust and the rhetoric of mistrust and what is fake has also gotten really out of control, um, particularly when you have, you know, the former president of the United States um, using the term fake news uh, in relation to probably um, legitimate news and the rest. So we're, we're in a kind of hysteria at the moment. And for me, I think there will always be a role for media literacy and I 100% agree with Annabelle around that being a requirement of citizenship. Um, I, I think that there are questions around also the mainstream media's role in amplifying disinformation and the digital literacies and sophistication of those who are able to manipulate them. So it's, it's almost getting impossible to keep up. And that's where this question about the role of technology comes in. 
because if we have tools, I think that can help nip some of this in the bud before it gets to that point of amplification, then, um, and then I think we can start seeing a way through it. That doesn't completely eliminate um, other measures, whether that's regulation or industry regulation, even something like Twitter putting up a little sign saying that this information hasn't been authorized or whatever the message is. Um, so there are technologies around that, uh, and I think Jason can add to this, but there are certainly technologies um, that involve things like fingerprinting the original uh, content, um, you know, using blockchain and distributed systems to be able to ensure that you can't tamper with it at the source in that one location because it's actually held across many nodes and you would know. Um, and, and basically, these are technologies, I suppose, that they, they say they create content-aware hashes that they kind of say, this was the original, this, this is the right one, and then use artificial intelligence, uh, neural networks and the like, to go and scan for um, things that have been tampered with. So I think, you know, I think there's a long conversation to be had around what are the role of organisations, particularly public institutions, in that and ensuring that that occurs. Uh, but and, but for me, I think that the big the big thing that's coming up here is really that um, you know we we're already seeing a lot of automation everywhere in the world, and you know robo debt is a classic example in the social services where you have um, uh, algorithms which have been applied, but then no human came along and queried it. There was no double checking. There was no kind of um, ensuring that that information was correct. So there's always going to be, I think, I think what we're starting to see is that these are just a tool. They're not the answer. They raise, the automation technologies are best when they raise flags. Um, otherwise you could just end up creating more harm than good by having these AIs uh, eliminate really useful content um, or uh, other kinds of information. So, um, I've probably raised more questions than answers. Well, well uh, indeed, one question indeed. <laughs> if you say it, it raises flags, um, and, and given the fact that we, our generation, we, we're parents, we're educators, um, we try to teach our children or children in general what is what is fake and what's not fake. If it's almost impossible for us to to judge what's right, what is real and what's not real, um, eventually, is it then? just not technology that will help us to define what is fake is that where it will end the technology defines it for us instead of that we help to create media literate media literate people i think that's a, a concern that we become passive in this um because we have no way to be otherwise so there's 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 a there's a dark scenario in in what you're saying, um, and I suppose I'm an optimist because I think that <laughs> um, hopefully we will be able to stop this behaviour and and eliminate the bad actors or not not give them the voice that they need in the first place to start that because the world is not all bad. There are, you know. It, I'm not sure that's the majority of activity that's going on out there. But I, I do want to say that I think Mark Zuckerberg always looks like a robot or an avatar, <laughs> and we're thinking that's definitely going to be the case. We will never know if he's real or fake. No, I agree. Um, and on that note, I want to show you another video, and then I'll get to you, Jason. <laughs> I am Salvador Felipe Jacinto Dali y Domenec, and I am back. Even though Dali's been gone for 30 years, we're using artificial intelligence to bring him back today. In order to actually train this AI to, to reproduce Dali's likeness, we've started with finding the right footage of Dali, and then we split that up into frames where he's, he's looking the right way, and we pick the best frames to use for training from that. 
Our system learns exactly what he looks like and how his, his mouth moves and how his eyes move and his eyebrows and every little detail about what makes Dali Dali. This is actually a recreated version of Dali. It's not a person playing Dali with makeup. It is actually Dali. We're very careful to use his words um, so that you learn a lot about what he thought and the way he thought. People want access to art. They want a way in. It can be through technology, through learning about the artist. Greetings, welcome. This technology allows people to imagine for a moment that there is such a thing as immortality, to see Dali alive again. The whole future of Dali is explained in the Brother painting. I saw Dali, but like his actual form, full figure, speaking personally to me. He was welcome into the museum to see his art, and like I still have goosebumps. <laughs> it is good to be back. So, still have goosebumps talking to a fake uh, Salvador Dali. Jason, will we move in, in, into an era in which there is no distinction between fake and real media anymore? And, and, and what impact will this have on how we critically assess media? Yeah, thanks, Jan. Um, I think this is an arms race. This has always been an arms race in this sort of technologies of truth sense that um, ever since we've had technologies of visual reproduction and, and other sort of technologies of media, we've been caught in this arms race of the use of it for telling stories and you know casting spells versus the ability to discern truth from fiction and so on. So it's this, you know, whether we think of that as a technology is being used for good or evil, for encoding or decoding or whatever side of it is, um, there's nothing new in this, right? So it's sort of deep fakes and visual media is just the latest in thousands of years worth of, of this um, ongoing struggle. And I think as um, Ali Reni was saying before, the, 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 the real question here is, is just trying to ensure that these technologies, this technology stack that is in part behavioral, where you're wanting to teach people behavioral and, and skills to, to, to detect fakes, and then you want to augment them with technologies to detect that, and then you want to back it up with regulations and laws that make you know, lying a crime or what, whatever the thing is. But just this notion that you've got a, a stack of capabilities for the detection of, of lies and then a and on one side, and you just want to um, do everything we can to ensure that um, you know, we're putting as much skills and technologies on the side of truth detection, or, or, or you know, or, or truth representation, or lying detection, because the you know the thing about these technologies is that um, you know they're they're neutral in the sense that they can be used for whatever purposes and, and if they come into the hands of people seeking to deceive then very powerful technologies can create great deceptions and if we can um, you know spread these technologies amongst school children and 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 you know, push them out into the community as much as possible we arm them with those same technologies to detect that and I think just it's just fundamental to recognize that this is an arms race. We, this is not a problem that we can solve once and for all with just you know the, the creation of just good people that will only use technologies for good. Um, so you know it's, it's a thing that's we're stuck with this forever, um, and this is part of the process of, of just ensuring that um, we have as much of the capabilities, um, both behavioral, both um, sort of media literacies, both. Um, digital capabilities and put them in the hands um, where they are most likely to be used for good. And I think that's that's as much as we can do at this stage. Yeah. Um, in terms of using it for good, Annabelle, could, could, could fake people play a role in education? I've, for example, I've, I've seen an hologram presenting uh, uh, this, this man was a survivor from the Holocaust. 
and him, they made a hologram of him, and he was answering um, as a hologram, answering questions to a school class. Would you use a fake Salvador, Salvador Deli to, um, to use in an education program for kids or something similar? Um, Could it work? I, well, I personally would if, if, the, if, the, if the program or the way that it had been constructed and, and created was going to be effective enough and also effective enough for you to, to suspend your disbelief that you are sort of engaging with um, an avatar. Um, we have done some experiments with um, virtual reality at ABC Education and it, what, whilst it wasn't um, sort of using fake avatars, it was actually um, immersing students in a world of giant bugs so that they could inspect um, mini beasts basically close up and that we had a had an audio track that took um, as, as you walked around around the um, the, the space um, you could interact with um, each of the bugs and one thing that we found is that students became very engaged and it didn't take very long for them to be immersed within the space that we had created for them that was one thing we were very sort of suspicious about, about whether it would actually even have an impact upon learning. But what we found is that when students went into that world and because of the audio track that we had and the, the sort of directions that we had given the students, um, there was um, a much more sort of retention of information and engagement with, with the subject matter. So when, when they're designed with, with a particular purpose to have an effect on teaching and learning, I think they can be very good. Um, other virtual reality um, experiences are, are not, not so good because you're always aware of the space around you and the actual interactivity and learning has no impact or difference to what you would have in a normal classroom. So it's about the way that it's actually executed and I think there's um, there's something to be said about that. But just as Jason was saying, um, if, if we're talking about like the power of these sorts of um, virtual experiences or avatars, you know, to be created and to be used in the classroom one thing that i think we should be doing is not only about using them as a tool to teach um, and from a pedagogical point of view of you know i'm not saying you know replacing a teacher but we should be encouraging and fostering students to create these experiences themselves and i think that's where like i mean if we're going to sort of um look at you know you know and um, make it an analogy that it's an arms race. We should be equipping students, you know, to, with the arms, you know, for good and for creation. And a um, media literate student is, a, is one who too can um, creatively, you know, um, who can create um, media um, using the tools that are available to them. Trust comes in place there. So trust is an important word. Trustworthiness, um, they're crucial mm -hmm. topics for archives, for, for collecting institutions. Um, with that, without a trust from the ones who trust uh, these institutions with their collections, their images, their heritage, their memories even, um, these institutions can't be relevant. Um, Ellie, uh, what role do you think collecting institutions play in providing trusted repositories for digital media? I think they play an extremely important role and one that will probably grow as these um, new technologies expand and become just, I suppose, more pervasive. Um, that what, what we have archives for is to be that, if not source of truth, at least record that um, something was uh, submitted at that point and checked and curated and deposited and now is you know hopefully preserved and maintained that's not to say someone can't put something fake into an archive <laughs> and i think they're the kinds of issues that institutions are going to have to deal with and 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 be equipped for um but they're i mean for me the question is not what they should be doing in their current role and with their, I suppose, current um, scope of work in terms of uh, preserving and curating content. But what will their expanded role be in terms of other content that's out there? Um, you know, are, are there 
ways or technologies or kind of um, systems that where say the citizen content is submitted um, and we're starting to talk about so much content that it becomes really hard to process um, and but perhaps there will be a way in the future for that for that kind of expanded role to occur uh, so institutions become um, the the tools themselves because we have these because we trust them because they um, play an incredible and important role in in the national interest um, and in the interest of us as citizens it's just uh, i suppose how do what are currently i suppose quite limited collections deal with the amount of content and information that now circulates in the world that's the thing that we're going to have to start to grapple with i think um, um imagine that technology would help us to define what sort of material we have to 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 write the metadata for us to recognize faces voices um, and so on still it's about trust and can we trust that technology for example but also can we trust the original file do we still know what's been the original part that went into the archive um, um, Jason, you just mentioned it already, but, but how does blockchain technology um, create an economy of trust in, in this way? Yeah, so blockchain technology is it's a database technology. It's a record keeping digital storage technology. But the, the difference between blockchain and um, centralized databases is that blockchains are distributed. It's a, it's a technology that enables you, that creates security by having records distributed across multiple nodes and that's where the safety comes from it just makes it very very hard to fake something because you've got to go and correct it on multiple you know that potentially thousands of, of nodes simultaneously and what that means is that it's, it's actually a biased technology it's very easy to detect whether someone has lied it's very difficult to lie with that technology so it's actually a technology that's weirdly not neutral in the sense it actually biases toward the uses for um, truth verification um, it's just part of it's just one technology layer in that process but i think this is why a lot of people are quite excited about blockchain as a record keeping digital distributed trustless technology because it just naturally um, architecturally biases on the side of truth it's 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 hard it's a technology that's hard to lie with or easy to detect whether someone has lied so the more we can push this technology into our institutions the better they become from a i mean the um, the more truthful they become or the easier it is to verify truth with them which is a really interesting development because previously um we've had to trust centralized institutions including you know archives and galleries and so on which have you know put a lot of effort into building you know reputations for integrity and quality and, and so on in and holding that trust and now we've got an, an additional technology to to complement that role which i think is is, is incredibly exciting Recently, there was an, an example in America. The National Archives of America used a picture from their own archives to advertise for an, um, an exhibition that they held uh, in Washington. It was about the Women's March. And just after Trump's um, inauguration in uh, 2017, they used a picture of that, of that march. And, and there were signs saying, God hates, hates Trump, for example. And what happened? to advertise for that exhibition, they blurred out the word Trump on many occasions. So you saw these blurred images um, from an archive. So it was an archive that used blurred images from their own archive. In, in this example, how would blockchain have worked? I mean, this was obvious. Uh, it, it was, you could see it, you could spot it, but it can be more subtle, of course. And, and how would blockchain play a role there? I can jump in there. Um, I think that, um, so for instance, what would be occurring with the technology in that instance is, it, it wouldn't just be blockchain, it would also be uh, other technologies that would be able to scan and find variations in that video timeline in the, in the video itself. And they could be very minuscule and not obvious to the human eye. So it would be able to see those differences. Um, I, I, I suppose if this is the 
if, if this is a permitted use where it's being changed, then you're possibly creating another version and putting that out there, that this is an adaptation of that original one. Um, but yeah, I think Jason raises an interesting point around, do we even need uh, national archives or institutions when we have these technologies? Uh, I, I think we still will, if you look at the, it, you know, if you look at the processes that go into all of that, even just that little thing of saying, well, there's the original video, but now we've made another one for this purpose um, and we need that to be authenticated and put in, you know, there's, there's still a kind of human dimension to all of this. It's not purely a, um, a, a, a technical process at all. And what does it mean for the role for an archive, if you, if you, if you describe it that way? What, what is eventually the role for an archive if technology can, can do everything from collecting to the preserving part to the sharing part, even the metadata? What, what is the role for an archive, or maybe an archivist in this case? It's about I'd actually like to know your thoughts on that, Jan. Yeah, I've got my <laughs> thoughts, but I would like to hear yours. So, I mean, in this sense, the um, all of the sort of technology stack from the the, the record, the, the trusted record keeping part, which is blockchain, the sort of um, you know, internet of things and, and, and machine learning aspect, which is going through and just trying to sort of find these, you know, um, pixel changes that are in there. I mean, all, all of that is just techn technical support for a fundamental role, which is largely around curation, um, classification, um, there's still the you know uploading and the choice of of, of what of, of what things are, are being put through and my view on the role of archives going forward is that this is going to be a golden era for them um, in the sense that because um, you know through the long 20th century a lot of i mean the, the, the um, nsfa has largely been um archiving into media productions and, and and content productions um a small section of the economy but more and more of the economy is keeping digital records of things and if you know eventually contracts instead of writing contracts down on paper and ink and then filing them in in, in filing cabinets we'll just say them straight into a camera and these contracts we were business contracts and employment contracts and all just other agreements between people um, as those things become more and more you know, integral to the organization of society and the needs for this to work at a global scale and so on. Um, that role of just record keeping of humans making promises to other humans um, needs to be kept and organized somewhere. And um, I, I think the, you know, what is that? Is that going to be the law firms? Is that going to be accountants? Is that going to be a government? You know, it, it, um, the sort of organizations like NSFA are actually in a perfect position to massively increase the scale and sort of social significance of what they do by drawing on exactly these same skills, um, technologically augmented to enable it to scale up, um, to enable the, con you know, the range of contents to go far beyond digital media and into just the commercial realms of, of, again, people making promises to other people and agreements, and we just need to keep um, you know, verified, um, factual, tamper-resistant claims about those things because everything is built upon that. Um, we I could extend the, that and so on. Yeah. I just think the other thing that we often neglect is that infrastructures are constellations of standards and um, agreements over how things are done. Um, and as these digital utilities become increasingly necessary in the world we are going to need people and organizations and institutions to come to agreements to cooperate um, to make decisions and to have processes in place so it's there, there's a very boring and mundane side to digital infrastructure um, that goes on behind the scenes that um, is hard work and it, right now extremely necessary work. And I think my fear is, is that if the cultural sector in general and national archives and other government agencies don't step up to that challenge, then we will have a fragmented um, technology landscape, which may involve some distributed platforms, um, which may be kind of you know, fantastic in their own way, but um, which essentially host a, a kind of myriad of, of private applications, some of which are good and some of which are harmful. 
so I think that there is a that there is a real need for for attention for policy making and institutions to step up and think about what do we need to do to to create these infrastructures the way we want them right now. Yeah. Can I just add a further point to that because the risk here is that if if these or if these public institutions don't do that, then private institutions will. And I think the real risk here is that this role ends up getting taken by you know without naming any sort of corporate names, yeah. but there are big technology, social media platforms that would love to do this role. Yeah. And there's, there's, there's a problem with that. Yeah, yeah. I understand. That's, because... There's a problem with that. There's a problem with that with um, with educational resources as well. Yeah. And that's why, you, I mean, we really need the cultural institutions and um, even, you know, the idea of the, the, the national estate, you know, for students to be able to rely upon um, and teachers too, so that they can, you know, get high quality, you know, reliable sources for them to use in the classroom context. So would you consider um, archives and collecting institutions, Annabelle, as these trusted sources for your education programs? Yeah, and certainly. Like I mean, that's like I mean, certainly with um, all of the re resources that we've got on ABC Education, the our most popular um, resources are the ones that we co-create with um, cultural institutions such as libraries, galleries, museums, and archives. Um, they're they're ones that sort of and it opens the access um, of those resources to the classroom teacher and therefore and but via the teacher to students as well. Um, they're actually sort of crucial in that in that sort of sense. And also teachers are um, at, at the moment, uh, and I think, well, may, maybe it will continue to be so, but they, one of the reasons that they um, trust ABC education is because of the reputation and the editorial, editorial reputation that the ABC holds. So um, that is, you know, we have such a high trust factor and we're very fortunate and we're very mindful not to sort of take advantage of that. So that's why it's really important that we keep on partnering with trusted, other trusted institutions. I'd like to show you another video about fake news. As the COVID-19 epidemic sweeps across the world, it's been accompanied by a tsunami of misinformation. Drink lemon and bicarbonate. Oh my Salt God. Salt water, chlorokine. Hold your breath over 10 seconds to check if your lung is healthy. If you keep sipping hot water, that washes it down to your stomach. At a time when reliable information is vital for public health, fake news about COVID-19 might be spreading even faster than the facts. We're not just fighting an epidemic, we're fighting an infodemic. Fake news spreads faster and more easily than this virus and is just as dangerous. Researchers across the globe are working to understand how misinformation spreads. And new models suggest that while the fight against fake news can seem hopeless, it might not take too much effort to tip the balance. The Reuters Institute at Oxford University has been looking at samples of fake news picked up by international fact checkers. Sure. This is Jay Scott Brennan. So I think before we started, I, I, I would have guessed that most of the claims had to do with health information or health misinformation. Uh, but what we saw was that the most common type of claim had to do with the actions or policies of public authorities. Scott and his team analysed the content, origin and reach of 225 pieces of fake news. About 60% of the content involved recontextualizing, reworking or reframing, you know, a grain of truth or, a, or an, you know, a true fact in a way that it was no longer true. For instance, one video claimed to show crows in the centre of Wuhan at the height of the pandemic, with text implying they were attracted by dead bodies. In fact, this video was uh, from another city in China, a thousand miles away. While it did show crows, those crows being right in this city had nothing to do with the pandemic at all. The team also found that mainstream media was not exempt from spreading fake news. We did see a significant amount of misinformation in the sample that was on television, things like press conferences or presidential debates, and that could also be a very significant channel of this type of misinformation.
Yes, misinformation, infodemic, uh, and obviously uh, COVID-19 has been a catalyst in, in uh, the spread of fake news. Uh, Annabelle, how, how has the era of fake news impacted on the way media literacy is taught? Yeah, well, um, it's sort of, um, I'm, I'm going to be a bit glib here, but um, when we when we first started to engage with media literacy and um, we sort of launched Media Literacy Week, which I, I might, I need to add that had been very well established within Northern America and Canada for some years. Um, but we only started it here in Australia um, a few years ago and it was um, at, in 2018. So it had come off the back of Trump's inauguration and um, all, all the, you know, the, the claims, or I guess where that phrase became very popularised of, of fake news. And I'm being a bit glib in, in saying that if we had called Media Literacy Week Fake News Week, it would have been... Um, maybe a thousand times more popular than um, Media Literacy Week. But uh, uh, media literacy, of course, is more than just news literacy and, and looking at that. But that, having said that, that's been very um, fortunate for media literacy educators to bring their cause to the forefront within the classroom and to get students and teachers to think critically about the media with which they're engaging. So one thing that we try to do with the resources that we've got in ABC Education is to get students to go back to basics really about how they engage with the news and get them to understand what public service journalism is or what good quality journalism looks like, whether it's paid for, whether it's commercial or not, um, what are the principles of good journalism and how that's going to sort of affect their everyday lives as they're going through school and then they become adults to become um, citizens, you know, to be able to discern information that's around them, whether that's at the polling booth, whether it's um, in, with news, whether it's with that sort of misinformation that's being spread about um, a pandemic, so or um, the information about the disease itself. So we've seen it so the fact that it's sort of been fortunate in bringing it to the forefront even though media literacy educators have been um, advocating for media literacy within the curriculum for for many decades um, but it has been a, a fortunate sort of turn of events to sort of bring the focus back into the classroom on media literacy thanks annabelle Jason, a more general uh, approach towards digital economies. Uh, how do you see digital economies transforming the landscape for, for media organizations, collecting institutions and the arts sector, for example? Yes, good question. The, the main transformation here is that everything becomes a platform. Um, that the idea that um, a digital economy is, is, is really one where instead of having lots of separate firms doing their own thing, the role of platforms um, as brokers between all sorts of you know people wanting to find information and people coming together on that become far more important. So the rise of platforms um, is, is, is the key sort of um, structural change in, in, in a digital economy, which then raises the question of how you govern platforms, how you control them. Is, is, does this mean that, um, as Ellie Rennie was sort of pointing out, that we need to think of them more as infrastructures or utilities? Um, do we need to sort of go towards a much stronger regulatory um, guidance to them? Or do we just go the opposite approach and just um, open slather, let technology sort this out? Um, but whatever sort of option we end up with, that really is the focus, is, is that we're entering into a new sort of industrial era where instead of corporate forms battling it out in markets, it's actually platform infrastructures that are the, that are the, the sort of governing technologies. And what does it mean for the role for the for the collecting institutions for the for the cultural organisations? Well, I, th I think they just have to be um, a significant part of that. But as I sort of indicating before, I, I think there's the in a you know in a digital economy where so much more of the of, of economic production and value is of digital form and you know digital assets and digital representations of assets are carrying more and more value as money is digital it's just more and more of the economy has either digital representation or is digital production um the the role of organizations and agencies that are providing services such as is this true or 
the basic sort of record keeping of storage was that the same thing that you saw in the previous parts um connecting that into the way that works in the court systems and others and other sort of parts of of you know, social infrastructure i think is, is is going to be more important um now whether they can successfully make that transition you know i, I hope that we will we'll see that but that will be challenging um and i think the main point from where i sit is that that means massive investment in digital um and just you know recognizing this is an arms race um this is a this is a, a, a digital fund fundamentally new tech infrastructure and for these institutions to play to step up and play a bigger role they need to embrace and you know be right at the frontiers of that technology i think that's a pretty depressing picture in some ways because what we've seen in terms of how platforms um develop and, and grow uh, we end up with these kind of oligopolies of uh, in the same way that you know media concentration has happened in the past we're now seeing that on the internet um i think this is where the potential for distributed technologies is interesting not just in that it is a fundamentally different way of uh coordinating and and um using the internet um web3 we call it uh which which is about decentralization not centralization but because hopefully that um economy that emerges there can empower um those who are, who don't have those resources to become dominating platforms mm. so i mean i think one of what what i think of when i see that um that video about covid disinformation is that you know the, one of the problems here is we don't have a diversity of media anymore we have uh, a few media outlets some of which are seriously problematic and then we have um you know kind of internet business models for content which are predatory destructive and um you know are, are getting money in all the wrong ways so what what a um i suppose an alternative to that is if we can have blockchain and distributed infrastructures and better institutional infrastructures as well is something that enables payments to go where they should go for people who are viewing things for content creators uh royalties to be distributed as micropayments um where they're due and um you know essentially a better digital economy that's what blockchain is about and uh i can't see any of this being resolved unless we can resolve platform politics itself and the problems of um of of those large platforms and it's been very interesting watching you know facebook's umming and ahhing about you know what kind of content they should moderate um and and twitter i suppose being far more active in that respect and just our reliance on these large large corporate companies to be able to do that work for us to maintain our um our democracies is is alarming and the influence of technology is huge and actually what you were saying that's that's maybe even uh, even more depressing jason when you talked about the massive investments we need to be able to cope with that sort of things mm -hmm. that will be difficult for for public institutions collecting institutions what do you see there uh, the role for public private partnerships is that is that a solution is that part of how we should yeah, look at the future it may well be but i think the more um the more hopeful sort of aspect of this is just to recognize that a lot of these infrastructures are software right they're, they're um and a lot of that software is open source software so a lot of the sort of capabilities not just to use but also to to produce are actually free they're they're there for the you know um they're only limited by the skills and you know again a type of literacy to use that so you know if you compare it to previous infrastructures you know, industrial era infrastructures of pipes and steel and, and and ports and so on that were big physical expensive things that were clearly either owned by private in you know individuals or publicly owned the digital infrastructure is is actually far more interesting in that sense a lot of it is 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 you know just on the internet a lot of it is able to be um costlessly 
reproduced or, or, or modified. Um, it's so I think in that sense, which which means that it, it can be opened up to communities and civil societies and voluntary organizations for building and not just using um, in, in, in far more powerful ways. And in, in, in a lot of ways, I think we're possibly just right at the beginning of that, of, of, of recognizing a lot of that power. And um, one of the interesting things about blockchain infrastructure is there are very few patents on it. It's not private property, it's 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 community property. Um, the a lot of the um, abilities to use it are it's, it's permissionless. You can fork things and you can take things and modify them and push them back out again without having to seek permission from anyone to do so. So I, I think you know while the sort of public-private infrastructure model is was it you know, is, is still a good solution for industrial era economies, digital era economies actually have some quite interesting affordances that um, we, we're possibly still at the beginning of using these. And again, I would sort of, I think the main constraints here really are um, citizen capabilities and, and you know, technical literacies to, to use and build. Yeah, so, so open software, white, white label so, uh, software interfaces, yeah. that sort of things could, could be of great help for that sort of institutions, you think? Yeah, very much so. In the meantime, guys, we, we, with only 10 minutes left, and in the meantime, I see questions coming in from f via Twitter and Facebook. So I would like to ask, I think this is um, maybe something for Ellie as well. From an archiving point of view, is there a hope that artificial intelligence may lead to the discovery of previously unknown content through things like facial recognition? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, that's that's an exciting prospect. I think um, it, at the moment, I, I think that, I mean that's a basic search uh, problem, and that's that's where the technology is definitely advancing and becoming useful. And I mean, how wonderful would it be to say, you know, I want to find every video in an FSA that has. Um, a woman speaking in it oh, I don't know. <laughs> might be less than you think um, and, um, and and you know so to be able to to create I mean as a researcher that would be exciting but certainly you know to be able to find um, important historical figures in footage that we didn't know that we had would be would be wonderful yeah thanks I think that's definitely coming yeah Thank you. Another question. Um, this is probably for uh, for you, Annabelle. Um, mm -hmm. A very practical question. What can people do today to help their households and workplaces more media literate? Yeah, there's there's lots of um, resources around. Like, I mean, obviously, I'm going to talk about the ABC Media Literacy site, where we do have. Even though it's it's aimed at for students, we know that it has been very helpful and being used in libraries um, within different communities around Australia and overseas, um, and it's also been suitable for university students as well. So on that site which is just on, if you type in ABC Education Media Literacy, you will find the site, but we've got a range of um, resources there, over about 60 at the moment um, that we've built up over the last three years. Um, for things on questioning media, um, so, you know, things like, you know, how do you sort of detect um, fake news? You know, how do you tell the difference between satire, those sorts of, um, between satire and something that's deliberately trying to mislead you? Um, what's the difference between fact analysis and opinion? Um, how we, We've also got a range of resources about sort of the role of public service journalism and why that's important in, you know, 2020 and beyond. So we've got those resources. Um, there's also some really fabulous resources that are put together by the North American Media Literacy Association, which is called NAM NAMLE is the acronym there, N-A-M-L-E. Um, they have some wonderful resources. For parents, um, I would recommend going to somewhere like Common Sense Media. That's an, also a very popular website for for, for teachers, um, for parents, um, mind you. And um, Stanford University has um, a, an amazing sort of research, um, resource, a collection of videos on misinformation, which they're calling um, for a need for students and teachers and for citizens around the world to have some civic online reasoning and um, if you type in if you search for stanford university civic online reasoning you will find those um resources but they've got things like 
well, how do you find better information online? Because media literacy is often not only just about detecting fakery or foolery, it's about sort of verifying the quality of information that's being presented in front of you. So they take you through sort of a series of steps and a series of videos on how to find better information online, how to use Wikipedia um, wisely, how to sort fact from fiction, um, and also how to sort of, you know, navigate um, the sort of very complex news media um, landscape. I might also, um, this is quite a sort of a, a practical sort of um, sense to take. So just um, at the end of last year, or the beginning, beginning of this year, the Australian Media Literacy Alliance was formed, which is a small group of um, well, it's the ABC together with some leading cultural institutions, um, including the National Film and Sound Archive, including the Australian, um, including the um, Australian Library Information Association, the Museum of Australian Democracy, um, and a couple of universities, the Queensland University of Technology and the University of Western Sydney, and we're ba we're ba um, sort of banding together, banding together to promote the cause of media literacy and the necessity of it to be within um, school curricula around Australia, but um, also uh, about the importance of media literacy um, within the community. And on the AMLA website, which is medialiteracy.org.au, um, you'll be able to find the sort of a, a framework that um, some of the leading researchers in Australia, um, Dr. Michael Deswani, Dr. Tanya Notley, have put together um, a media literacy framework for Australia and sort of takes apart what it looks like to be a media literate citizen. So a media literate citizen reflects, understands, uses and um, achieves certain things by being media literate. So th there's some sort of useful resources as well. Um, there have also been some um, new resources that have been um, launched recently, one by the Alana and Madeline Foundation um, called the Media Literacy Lab, which is available um, to free to students around Australia which is suitable for students um, in years 7 to 10 as well so but um, on the ABC media literacy site we really try to incorporate things that are for students teachers and just for the general public as well and so we hope that the interactives and videos are um, sort of all, um, inviting for a much wider audience than just school children Thanks, Annabelle. And uh, I would almost say a media literate person would immediately detect that this is advertising for the Australia Media Literacy Alliance. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, one last question coming in here, and then we really need to wrap up. It's uh, seven o'clock. Uh, one last question. How will or should viral deepfakes and videos capturing reactions or civic impacts be archived to tell stories about this era of increasing information disorder? Who wants to answer that? I think we do. I think we should. Um, yeah. I think that I'm hoping that we are in a blip <laughs> and that we will be able to resolve this and that the historians of the future, look, we know that 2020 is going to be the most researched year for hundreds of years to come for many reasons and but this is certainly one of them so any data that we can give them let's do it nice yeah i want them archived for a different reason i want them archived as training data um yeah the same that's that that's exactly what they should be used for and this is the same way it's the same reason that biologists keep viruses in in in, in their labs just to study um, you you want to study the, the bad the bad things to learn how to protect them against yeah. the good things good I um, want to thank you all for this session. We can talk for hours about this, and, and actually I would love to, but it's seven o'clock, we need to wrap up here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annabelle, Ellie, Jason. Thank you. Hope to talk to you soon. Thank you for this session. Thank you very much. Goodbye.